Well, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. It's a uh, real pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much to the organization Tech Spirit for having us. We're extremely happy to be here, and it's, uh, it's really an honor. So my name is Angel Liu. Uh, I work for the, the Not Worldwide. Um, and actually, we're going to spend the next 30 minutes to speak a little bit about how to scale globally in a world where it's a little bit complex to, to navigate. But before of that, I just want to make a uh, show of hands and raise up your hands if you really know the not worldwide, what we do and who we are. Can I see a show of hands here? Uh, OK, that's a little bit sad for me. <laughs> it's a little bit less than half. But uh, I will try to explain, first of all, 10 minutes or five minutes, who I am, who we are, and why I'm talking today here. So just a little bit about myself. I'm Angel. I'm originally from Menorca. And these are a couple of things that, that I've done in my career. I was the CEO of IBB Hotels, coming from hospitality background, roughly 25 properties across Europe. And then I had the privilege and actually honor to work for Booking.com. Anyone knows Booking.com? Raise up your Oh, yeah. Now, now there you go, right? Uh, booking is, is well known. So I, was, I started at Booking in Barcelona. I was the general manager for Spain and other countries. And then I moved five years to San Francisco to run North and South America. And after that, I spent three years in Singapore being the vice president and the managing director for, for Booking. And at the end of that period of time, December of 2019, I had two phone calls that shook my world, right? that, that somehow uh, freaked me out. I just want to share with all of you what those calls were. So first of all, I had a call from Wang Lu, which was the general manager for China. And he called me and said, hey, Angel, you know what? We have to buy 5,000 face masks, and we have to close the office. And I'm like, Anthony, what were you talking about? What, what is going on? And he said, well, there's this virus around. Things are going to go down pretty rapidly, so we better do stuff like that. So I just got a, uh, a little bit nervous. And, and when I'm nervous, what I always do is to call a person that is a great mentor for me. It's, it's my source of inspiration and, and helped me through my career, which is my wife. So I call her, and I'm like, hey, Esther, where are you? And she's like, I'm in the supermarket. So what's up? Said, look, Wang Lu called me, and he's telling me that there's a virus and things are going down. And she tells me, well, I don't know if things are going down, but there's no toilet paper in Singapore, right? So uh, we, ha we have an issue here. That's where we, we realized that things were going down quite, quite badly. And I think that the rest is history, right? I think it's been a um, Quite unfortunate, the situation that we all have to live in. And definitely, that call made a, a huge impact on myself. But the second call that made an impact on myself was somebody, a lady from a company called The Not Worldwide, that called me and, and actually offered me a, a, a great job, a great position. And I, you know, they told me, we are a wedding technology company. So how does that sound to you? And I was like, yeah, OK, but I, I don't know much. So started talking with them, and suddenly I realized that, well, the product is actually quite good. The industry is bringing hundreds of millions of euros as a TAM, as total addressable market. The people in the company are actually quite smart. The private equity behind, these guys are top notch. So I'm kind of, kind of liking it. So I call my wife and I say, hey, Esther, uh, what do you think about all of this? And there was silence in the phone. So she told me, well, Angel, first of all, what do you know about weddings? And I'm like, yeah, nothing. Uh, how about an industry that is worse affected than COVID than weddings? Can you imagine something like that? And I'm not, no, either. And then she told me, why do you want to leave booking in a great position? The, the, to start with, I don't know how even you get there. Uh, for something that you just don't understand, right? And, and that, call, that conversation, that call, it was a little bit tough for me. But after some conversations, we decided to take the, the risk. And I have to say that it's been a year. It's been a year being at the Knot Worldwide. And I couldn't be happier and prouder to be in this organization that, that I am in. So what is what we do and, and who we are? 
So basically, our vision is just to help couples in their most in, or one of the most important moments in life, right? And, and we do that basically giving a, a ton of tools, a ton of services to the couples while bringing a lot of business and a lot of value to the vendors that we have. And we do that with different brands that we have across the world. So in a nutshell, we are both things. We are a B2B marketplace, where as I'm saying, we're giving inspiration, tools, and products for free to the couples and our users. And then we put them in contact with all the vendors that we have. And to the vendors, what we're doing is we're just bringing them a ton of value. We give them tools and analytics, and basically we give them a lot of knowledge. And we monetize them through advertising fees across the year. And that is how we make the, the revenue. So we are a marketplace B2B company. But at the same time, we are an e-commerce platform too. So we have a B2C business whereby we have some of the products that we showcase in our platform that they are actually the transaction happening in our platform, like registry or, uh, or invitations. And we are not a startup. We have more uh, roughly 2,000 people across the world. The headquarters are in New York. And I basically have the privilege to be the president for international business. So I run and I lead uh, all the business outside of US and Canada. And our headquarters are here for international business, are here between San Cugat and, uh, and Barcelona. Our idea, and as I said before, we are in a unique position of uh, you know, doing something great uh, with the industry that we have. Our financials look actually very, very solid. And our goal is to keep growing uh, in order to paint, as we say, the world green and to make sure that we can be and we can scale across the world in the, next, uh, in the next years. So how are we going to do that? And that is why I'm here today. I will, I will give you a couple of thoughts of how we're thinking about it. It's just our opinion. But I hope that we can bring uh, some food for thought to, to all of you. So I'm going to talk about four things. I'm going to talk about, first of all, data and technology, how we ship product on the fastest way possible. I'm going to talk about supply and demand part of the business and how we're thinking about scaling that piece. Then I'm going to talk something that I am extremely passionate about, which is people. I think that sometimes we are underestimate that, that piece. So I will spend a little bit of time on that. And I will finish saying how we see the, the workplace in a, in a situation where COVID still is with us and what are the things that we're doing. I love this statement, right? And I will start with this. In God we trust, all the rest, please bring the facts, please bring, bring, bring the data. And, and I think that this is extremely true. And as a company, when we're thinking about taking decisions in technology and shipping products, this is an axiom that we have. And we follow this hierarchy of truth for making decisions. This basically is the, which is the best way to take a decision in a, in a technology platform, right? And uh, the first one is divine and absolute insight in everything, which unfortunately, this is not possible for humans unless you are, you are my wife and, and it's, you're, you're pretty close to it. Then you have A-B tests, which is the way that basically it's the most empiric and the most factual base in order to take decisions in a technology company. Anyone knows what A-B testing is? Yeah? Great. We're going to do a we're going to do a game now, so we're going to see how, how good we are. So for the people that does not know A/B testing, basically you have two versions of your app or of your web page. You split the traffic to both of them. You do a small change, and then the version that works good is going to be the one that you're going to have for the future, and you continuously do changes on on that one. So that is something that for us is extremely important. And then we have. Number three and number four, which is more human-driven, right? Uh, FP&A, data analysis and correlation, and then expert opinion that, believe it or not, still there are lots of companies that are you know, running and taking decisions through expert opinions, which for us is not the best way to, to go with it. And then you have the last two, when everything else is not, uh, not there. So A-B tests. We're going to do a game. Basically, I'm going to show you two versions of our product. And basically, you guys will tell me which one you think that works better. Right? So we're, we're going to test your, your knowledge. And let, then let's see after three tests who wins, who wins the, the contest. So basically, what you're going to see here, 
when you go into our platform and you click, for example, venues in Barcelona, there's a list of venues that appear. So when you click in one of them, this is the page that you will see. So what I need you to do is please stand up. Everyone, please stand up. Everyone, I think the left side also, please stand up. Awesome. Great. Just to have a little bit of movement here. So I'm going to show you both variants, variant A and variant B. So you have to tell me which one do you think that will convert better, which variant will work better for the consumers. So that's A. This is B. Where's the difference? You guys see it? Not really. OK, the difference is just down here. In the version A, we have a button that says, send me a quote. So we are appealing towards the money, right? the cost of the product that you want to buy. So we're appealing to the economics of it. The other version is exactly the same, but it says, please send a message. So we're appealing more to the social part of the consumer, more the, the connecting piece. So if you think that A works better, raise your left hand. If you think that B works better, raise your right hand. If you think both work equally, raise both of your hands. Go. OK, I see people here a little bit right or left. So if you have your right hand up or both hands up, please sit down. The others, please stand up because the variant A was the correct one. So you guys keep playing. Now you get me, right? So, so you can see in the, in the first test that we have actually a little bit of people sitting down. So the left side works better. It converts better, and we're having more sales from our product with that variant. OK, let's go to the test number two. Variant A, this is in desktop, same concept. And this is variant B. Where's the difference here? It's hard to see, right? Yeah, hard to see. Up there, so this is not a copy change. This is a functionality. So when you have the ranking and you click on a venue, on the first variant, it will be another tab that opens up, another window. In the variant B, when you click on it, the information will pop up in the same screen that you are. So which one do you think that works better, A or B? Left hand A, right hand B, both hands. Ah. Uh, yeah, the one sitting, you guys cannot play because you missed before. You can play if you want, though. So right hand, please sit down. Both hands, please sit down. OK, so we still have five, six people playing. Variant A converts better. It works better if you have two screens than if you have one screen. And let's go for the last one. This is when you have to send information about yourself to a vendor. And you're showing you have to put your, your personal data. What works better, this version or a more reduced version? Left hand, version A. Right hand, version B. Both hands, both equally. Actually, both hands. So if you did, were not having both hands, so as you can see, thank you very much for uh, an applause for the last ones. Inconclusive, it doesn't matter what you do, it's going to be the same, the same uh, kind of results. So what I'm trying to say with all of this is that if you really have to ship product very rapidly, which is our case, A-B testing is the best way to do that. And sometimes it takes a little bit of muscle to bring all this data and to do all these systems, but at the long term, it definitely pays out in order to make sure that the decisions that we make are in the best way possible. Great. Point number two, uh, business scalability. I love a quote from Jeff Bezos. He was asked, hey, in Amazon, what are the new things that you guys have to do in order, in order to unlock more growth? And he said, well, look, I don't know which are the new things that we have to do, but I will definitely tell you which are the things that will remain the same that we have to do. And I think that's important, in particularly when you want to scale, you really need to understand what are those things that are equal or you know, what are the, the, the core competitive advantages that you have that you want to keep no matter in which country you go. Because that is going to be even more important than what are the things that we have to innovate. So for us, and in our, under our opinion, we have two things here. And we are going to touch both sides of the equation. 
From the men's side, what we're trying to do is to bring as much content to the couples as we have in order to inspire them through the vehicles that they use, which in this case is social media, Pinterest, TikTok, Facebook, etc., Instagram. And then the other thing that it's very easy to scale is how we buy traffic, which, let's face it, in the Western world, it's still through Google. Google is king, right? So not, not, in the, not in Asia, by the way. In Asia, in some countries, Google is king. In some others, Google even don't exist. Uh, I know it sounds a little bit strange, but still, that is the case. So one of our beliefs is that we want to invest on the most rational way as much as we can. And I know that that sounds obvious, but basically what we're saying is that we always optimize demand acquisition with global returns of investments. We're not going into the nitty-gritty details on a per-country level, but we're trying to go uh, in the most rational way from, from a global perspective, because that in the long term allows you to invest as fast as you can and the more you can. The other side is how we deal with the supply, and I think it's this one I, I, I enjoyed actually quite a bit because I've seen in many commerce or in, uh, in many marketplaces around the world that actually when you put two products in competition, the one with the biggest supply always wins. And that is something that we strongly believe is the case no matter in which country we go. And by, uh, meaning, yeah, size matters in the sense of you want to have in your marketplace as many vendors, type of vendors as possible, which, which is what we call breadth, and also the biggest number of possible of all those categories, which is what we call uh, depth. So you want both. You want breadth and you want depth. If you are able to do that, automatically the conversion of your web page will just go up quite drastically. If you convert better, you can buy more demand. If you have more demand, they will buy more your products. If you, they buy more your products, everything is a kind of a positive flywheel that scales up quite, quite fast. So under our opinion, knowing the attribution and the rational spend that you do in Google is actually key, plus really making sure that you have the biggest part of the supply as you can capture in each of the markets. Number three, I said that I'm a little bit passionate about, about this topic, about, about people. So I'm going to talk about how we see our culture, how we, how we are growing it. Uh, and also then I'm, I will speak about a, uh, a mental health kind of burnout situation that I think it's pretty, pretty common lately uh, across, the, across the board. So culture. Do you know about the hippo? Apart from the animal, do you know what a hippo is? is the highest paid person opinion, right? So basically the opinion of the boss. We are really against the HIPPO framework, as I said before. We are more data-driven. We are more bottom-up culture, and we democratize more decisions that we do. And the reason that we do that is because we strongly believe that when you have HIPPOs in the company, that sometimes there's a lot of them, uh, you create what, what it's called a single point of failure, right? Meaning. It's impossible that that one person knows everything about the whole world. So we basically have to, if you want to grow fast and if you want to expand, you really have to have a culture where delegation is a must, where trust is a must, and you can avoid this type of single point of failures. It's, a, it's very theoretical, but at the end of the day, it's, it's one of the things that we think that it's the most valuable for the culture of the company. Plus, the fact, in particular when you are in a tech company with a lot of A-B testing, that failing is something normal. And actually, what we're trying to do is do a lot of experiments, a lot of tests in a very rapid way, fail a lot, but learning a lot. Because that, for the long term, will basically drive the decisions that you have to make on the best way possible. And the last piece is space. We're going very, very, very fast, actually. Things are changing week after week. The growth, it's, it's quite important, and we have to be adjusted to this. So I worked in, in Asia, as I said, for, for a few years, and, uh, and I thought that technology in Silicon Valley was super quick. But when you live in Asia, you realize that technology works in one time of unit less than in the Western world. Let, let me explain that. So, Anything that takes a year 
to ship or to do in the Western world, it takes one quarter in Asia. Anything that takes one quarter in the Western world takes one month in Asia. Anything that takes a month takes a week in Asia. Anything that takes a week takes a day in Asia. And this type of pace, it's not, not in that level, but this is how I would describe the culture of the knot of things that are happening every single day and, and how fast we move in any way of uh, technology development or in terms of, of a strategy, which, in all to all, it's a, it's a pretty particular culture that we are thinking that it's the right if you really want to grow in a, in a fast way. With, with culture comes leadership, and I think that one also is uh, it's important to mention. The other day I was in a, in a kind of this type of events online, and they were trying to define what leadership means or what are the most important attributes. And, and to be honest with you I, was, you, know, I was listening there and people were saying things like, yeah, leaders have to have, you know, they have to be visionaries. They, they, they have to inspire. They have to change the world. They have to be extremely smart and bright. Which, to be honest, all of that is true. But uh, the not worldwide, we're thinking about one attribute that for us is the most important thing, which, which is actually being a good person. And I think that's, you know, we underestimate that. Because at the end of the day, you can be the smartest guy in the room, but if you are a, a sorry, a cocky bastard, you are a cocky bastard, right? Uh, at the end of the day, people follow people. And that is the truth. If you want teams to work on the best way possible, you better have leaders that they are, well, good person, it's, it's hard to measure, but you know, that they have integrity, that the ethical values are strong, and that they have passion for people. If they don't have passion for people, and it's impossible to develop teams in a grand scale in a very quickly way, you really have to embed it in yourself to be ready to, to teach people, to give delegation, and to grow as fast as possible. If not, it's, it's just a, a no-go. I always love a quote that says, leaders will, leaders will be reminded on, on how they make people feel more what they knew, right? More than anything else. And I, and I strongly believe in that. And, and definitely, when you want to grow fast, yeah, you really have to give trust. You have to delegate. And sometimes I get the comment of, well, yeah, but that is, that is a little bit fluffy, right? That it's beautiful, that it's like purple dust, like it's, it's like unicorns flying and stuff. Well, you know, we play hard, but we work hard. Meaning that if you are able to have a proper balance between being people focused, but at the same time, extremely driven by business, that's the right balance to have. So this is something that we consider it's in very important, and in particular to have meritocracy, right? And to treat people differently. People that delivers great, hey, Better pay, better compensation, better development. People that work a little bit less, well, they have to have what they really deserve. No, and, and, and we are having that balance between meritocracy and being people-focused, which is extremely important for us. Great. This is a topic that I think it's, uh, in the last few years, I've seen a couple of times, and well, not a couple, several times, and I think it's, and I think it's pretty unfortunate, right? There's a lot of talk about, you know, people being burned out or people with, with mental health, kind of a stress. And uh, there's a lot of literature and a lot of articles and a lot of best practices about this. And uh, today, I guess, what I wanted to share with all of you is a story that the, uh, I had a, a boss that was my, well, the best boss that I've ever had, Tom Dunlap, uh, ex-Microsoft guy. And he, tell, and he told me a story, and this is what I wanted to share with you, right? More than um, how we're seeing this in, in the nut. So he told me the following, right? He told me, look, Angel, uh, in life, we are constantly juggling balls. It's kind of a, a matter of trying to keep many things in the air and doing many things in your life at the same time. And sometimes you're trying to balance many things, and yeah, it's hard. Right? You, you are in a lot of pressure because you want to keep everything floating around and you want to keep doing all those things. And each ball represents a part of your life. One ball might be the work, another ball might be your friends, another ball might be your hobbies, another ball might be your pets or traveling, whatever you want. And you're trying to keep everything balanced at the same time. 
So sometimes, you know, one of the balls falls down, and, and, and you have to, you know, pick it up and, and, and keep juggling however you can. Sometimes, one ball actually might fall down, and you have to stop. You have to gather all your balls and start from the beginning, or you have to change your ball, like, I don't know, change of job or change of work. And that is tough. But there is one ball that is made out of crystal. And if that ball falls, that ball breaks. And that one you really want to keep close to your heart. That one you have to do your utmost best in order to making sure that you can let fall all the balls of the world, but not that one. And that one you're going to keep it here, you know, here in your heart and strongly. And that ball, that crystal ball that breaks, that one is family. So I got that message imprinted, you know, in, in my blood, in my brain. And I think it's true. If you have, look, let me put it in another way. I work like a beast, like 150%, 200% of my energy. But I will never, ever, ever, ever jeopardize my two sons or my wife for anything in the world, like literally. And when you have priorities so strong and so clear, I don't know if mental health is going to be uh, solved or not, but definitely it makes the, the trip much, much easier for all of us. And each of us has a different crystal ball. Ah, for me, it's family. For another, might, might be saying, yeah, for me, it's traveling or whatsoever, which, hey, fair enough. Who am I to judge? But having clarity, perspective, and priorities is extremely, extremely important. Great, I'm going to finish with, with this. Uh, I think COVID changed the, the world on how we work. So I just want to share with you how we're working, in particular in Barcelona and San Cugat. We have been optimizing for safety and security. So basically, we want to make sure that our employees have the best uh, workplace possible and the, most, and the safest. And COVID is not going to go away anytime soon. So basically what we have implemented is a hybrid model where we believe on having both things at the same time. By both things, I mean having people fully remote or having people actually in the office. We have seen that productivity and results have not changed and actually have improved. The only thing that is still is a question mark is how the culture will be affected in the long term. And I think there is a little bit of risk on that when you have a... Uh, majority of the workforce in full remote as we have it today. But we'll see. For the moment, though, we think that having that balance is the most important thing that we can do. And uh, results are there, so we're going we're gonna to keep it. So that's it. Just want to share with you and give you a little bit of food for thought on how we're thinking about scaling companies in, a, uh, in the future. And definitely, I don't know if, if we're going to be able to do it, but definitely this is what we believe in. And I will finish saying the, the following, right? I think uh, we're extremely happy to be in Barcelona. We are extremely, extremely happy to, you know, uh, to be part of this uh, tech community that, that has been here for a while and they were continuously, you know, keep building. And uh, to be honest, I think that Barcelona is a great city to live in, a great city to attract talent and to retain talent. And, uh, well, you ha only have to go outside, right? The weather is great. Food is awesome. But the technology environment, actually, it's also quite cool. And I think that events like this one are, are extremely important to build that up. There are a lot of companies and big names that are coming to Barcelona. And I think that, it's, that is also only creating value for, for all of us. I don't think everything is great, though. I think that there are certain things that, I don't know, under my opinion, should improve. And, and the tax situation, I think it's, it's one of those. I think the tax framework that we have, it's... Uh, sometimes complicated, in particular when you compare with other cities like, I don't know, Amsterdam, where situation is a little bit easier to, to navigate. No? So I think that, uh, think in Barcelona as a city, we compete with very important cities too in the rest of Europe, and, and that point, it's, it's one of the points that I definitely would, uh, at least would suggest to, to review somehow. So that's it. I said at the beginning that we're trying to paint the world green. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do it, but definitely we're going to give it a shot, in particular from our headquarters here in Barcelona. So thank you, thank you, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much.